Oh God, we want the real stuff, not that fake fruit. We have fallen for the counterfeit before. Love, joy, and peace. Your fruit growing in us. Even in these moments where we contemplate, grow that fruit in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've ever played the game of hearts, and you probably have, you know that a, that a heart can trump it all. But isn't that the great truth of life? A heart makes all the difference in the world. So here's the question. What are you doing with your heart? What am I doing with my heart? Are we willing to give our heart away? Man, it sounds like we're getting ready for a Valentine's moment or something. No. Instead, a very compelling story that I'm going to read you in just two moments. First, a one-liner. The one-liner sets the story up. And this is such an amazing one-liner. It appears only in one place in the Gospels, the Gospel of Mark. Take a look at this. I want you to see it. Just one line. Mark chapter 10, is it? Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Find it in your Bible because you need to see it. It's there in your Bible. Amazing little one-liner. has to do with Jesus. A kid grew up in a wealthy home, went to the best of schools, shows up one day, wants to see Jesus. Says, hey, Lord, what do I have to do to get saved? Jesus said, hey, what, uh, hey how, how are you doing with the Ten Commandments? <laughs> he said, man, I have kept the Ten Commandments since I'm knee high to a grasshopper. And now comes Mark's line, nowhere else in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 10, 21. Do you have it there, Matthew 10, 20, 21? One line, and Jesus looked at him and did what? And loved him. Look at that line. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. Come on, we say, we, we say it, don't we? Can you feel the love? Oh, I feel the love. You know, I, I, I have a feeling that as that young, wealthy man stands before Jesus, the eyes of Jesus look into him, I have a feeling he felt the love. Hey, listen, just because you feel the love doesn't mean you say yes to Jesus. We know he didn't. But that's just the deal. You have to make a decision. Perfect setup for the story. I want to read to you right now. Five years ago this month, Christianity Today published her testimony. Who are you talking about, Dwight? I'm talking about Rosaria Champagne Butterfield. Then Philip Yancey read her stunning first-person account and included it in his subsequent book published called Vanishing Grace. Got the book. It's a great book. I want to read the story to you in her words as, re as recorded by Philip Yancey. So here it is. Christianity Today, five years ago this month, published the testimony of Rosaria Champagne Butterfield, who described her younger self as a, quote, leftist lesbian professor who despised Christians. I tired, she writes, I tired of students who seemed to believe that knowing Jesus meant knowing little else. Christians in particular were bad readers, always seizing opportunities to insert a Bible verse into a conversation with the same point as a punctuation mark, namely to end it rather than deepen it. Stupid, pointless, menacing. That's what I thought of Christians and their God Jesus, who in paintings looked as powerful as a Breck shampoo commercial model. End quote. Nancy summarizes, as a professor of English and women's studies, Butterfield cared deeply about morality, justice, and compassion. For guidance, she looked to Freud, Hegel, Marx, and Darwin, and not to Jesus, mainly because of his zealous band of warriors, as she called them. While researching the religious right and their politics of hatred against queers like me, as she put it, she forced herself to read the Bible, the source that, in her opinion, had let so many people off track. She published a critical arc article in the local newspaper about Promise Keepers, which is, or, was an organization for men, and proceeded to file away the response letters in two boxes, one for hate mail and one for fan mail. One letter, however, fit neither box. In a kind and inquiring spirit, a Presbyterian pastor from Syracuse, New York, encouraged her to explore further her conclusions. How did she arrive at them? On what basis did she decide on her moral convictions? After first throwing the letter away, she later fished it out of the recycling bin and stared at it. 
Eventually, she accepted. I'm not going to believe this. Eventually, she accepted the pastor's invitation to dinner. And over the next two years, became friends with Ken and his wife, Floyd. She recalls, they entered my world. They met my friends. We did book exchanges. We talked openly, openly about sexuality and politics. They did not act as if such conversations were polluting them. They did not treat me like a blank slate, end quote. Meanwhile, Butterfield continued to read the Bible many times in multiple translations. Finally, she found herself, you're not going to believe this, in the pew of that pastor's church feeling conspicuous with her butch haircut. Her words again, then one ordinary day, I came to Jesus, open-handed and naked. In this war of worldviews, Ken was there. Floyd was there. The church that had been praying for me for years was there. Jesus triumphed. And I was a broken mess. Conversion was a train wreck. I didn't want to lose everything that I had loved. But the voice of God sang a sanguine love song in the rubble of my world. End quote. Yancey goes on. Rosaria Butterfield, now herself a pastor's wife, still champions morality, justice, and compassion. She came to faith in search of a foundation for what she valued, drawn by the tender care of two Christians who graciously pointed her to that foundation." End quote. Yancey then editorializes on Rosaria's personal testimony and makes a vital point for you and me. And I want you to get that point. In fact, you've got Yancey's words in the study guide. Pull it out right now. I want you to get it. This is, this is, this is good stuff. Pull your study guide out right now. As those of you that uh, didn't get a study guide, please put your hand up. Here come our ushers. They're coming your way up in the balcony. There they are. And those of you watching on uh, live stream right now, you already were, are where the study guide is, www.newperceptions.tv. But we're putting it on the screen for those watching on television. You see that uh, website there, newperceptions.tv. Go to that uh, website. You're looking for Game of Hearts. Can you feel the love? When you find that, it'll say study guide. Below that title, click on it. You'll have the same study guide. We'd love for you to have these quotes and the teaching this morning. All right? All right. Now for, for Philip Yancey's reflection on Rosaria's story. On the screen, please. The uncommitted, Yancey writing, share many of our core values, but if we don't live out those values in a compelling way, we will not awaken a thirst for their ultimate source. Christians can do no better than follow the example set by Jesus, who specialized not in techniques and arguments, but in spirit and example. He took skeptics seriously, listening to them and responding forthrightly, yet compassionately. The Gospel of Mark adds a telling detail to a scene in which a potential wealthy, con wealthy convert rejects Jesus' message and walks away. Jesus looked at him, right it in, and loved him. You have that line just above this quotation, Mark 10, 21. Don't ever forget that one line. It's the one to take home. Jesus looked at him, right? Loved in both places. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Did you get that? What Yancey's saying, I mean, Jesus did not specialize in techniques and arguments. He listened to people. He was honest. He was forthright in, in his response to them. But he did so with a compassion that just drew them. He looked at him and he loved him. Ken and Floyd looked at Rosaria, the leftist lesbian professor, and they loved her. They didn't argue with her. They didn't debate worldviews. They just loved her. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness. That was the heart of Jesus. That's the heart of God. And that's supposed to be your heart and mind, love, acceptance, and forgiveness for, for all people, no matter who they are, no matter why they are. No matter where they are, no matter what they are, you don't get a get out of, get out of love free card in this life. All people. Jesus looked at him and loved him. A few days ago, an anonymous note was left in my box in this church. My executive assistant, Claudia, she puts it on my desk, unopened. It's an envelope. On the outside of the envelope with red and Black pens, the writer presumably has decorated the envelope. Inside the decoration are these words, 
Thank you so much for helping. I opened the envelope, and I found inside it a small note folded in half right here. I opened the note. I read it. Thank you so much for everything you have done to help me grow closer to God as a gay person. I looked at the bottom. There's a signature, obviously intentionally illegible, like the signature on my birthday letters. <laughs> I read it again. Thank you so much for everything you have done to help me grow closer to God as a gay person and a little heart drawn by the signature. You know what? This anonymous note gives me hope, Pioneer, that we in this church, we in this congregation can become a force for God, a force for good, a force for God's healing world in a fractured and hurting world right now. Amen. We got to start somewhere. <laughs> got to start somewhere. You start with whoever shows up first. And when you're playing the game of hearts, what do you lead with? You're going to lead with love. Love will be your first hand. Love will be the first card. Love will be the first overture, just like Jesus. And he looked at him, and he loved him. Just like Jesus with the woman at the well. You remember her, that little Samaritan girl? Noontime, the disciples are gone. And she's heading out to the well in the heat of the day. Obviously, doesn't want to run into anybody. But bad luck, there is a young Jewish male sitting on the lip of that well, double whammy. And he looks at her. He smiles. He operationalizes no secret technique. Mm -mm. He avoids getting into no argument to prove that he's right and that she's wrong. Mm -mm. He just quietly asks for a favor. Man. I am so thirsty. Would you mind, would you mind getting me a drink of water? Knowing who she was, knowing the morality or the lack thereof by which she lived, Jesus' heart just simply, quietly, genuinely reached out to the stranger and asked a favor. Jesus looked at her, and he loved her. Never met her before in his life. Yancey comments. Put it on the screen for you. Turn again to the conversation between Jesus and a Samaritan woman who had found some solace in an alternative religion. What if Jesus had engaged in an argument with her about their differences over where to worship? Instead, he summoned up a thirst already evident in her troubled life of five failed marriages. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, he said to her, referring to the well water she was drawing for him. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of well water, welling up to eternal life. And then Yancey concludes, we dare not disdain the choices others have made, for that would not show love. Instead, we should tune in to the underlying thirst. Brilliant, just like Jesus. Jesus looked at her, and he loved her. The anonymous writer of my note clearly has a thirst for God. Help me, church, he or she is writing. Help me, church. Help me to go deeper with God. And if Pioneer, if we could be a church, a faith community where all who enter here have our pledge to love them, to accept them, and to forgive them, you wouldn't be able to keep the people away. Remember Jerry Cook's line last week? Jerry Cook in his book, Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness. Remember that line? Let me repeat it for you. Put it on the screen again from last week. The minimal guarantee we must make to people is that they will be loved. Write that in, please. They will be loved. Always loved. Under every circumstance, loved. With no exception, loved. The second guarantee is that they will be totally accepted without reservation. 
The third thing we must guarantee is that no matter how miserably they fail or how blatantly they sin, unreserved forgiveness is theirs for the asking with no bitter taste left in anybody's mouth. A church that can make that commitment to every person is a church that's learning to love and a church that will be a force for God, end quote. I was visiting with someone this last week who was politely challenging this notion of love, acceptance, and forgiveness without reservation. I mean, please, Dwight, are you serious? So, so okay, let me give you an illustration, this person said. Uh, so we get, a, we get a murderer in here, and we forgive him for that first murder. But what happens if next week he commits a murder, and then he asks for forgiveness? Are we supposed to forgive him? Stay, stay right here. What if he goes in the next week? And what, if it, what if he keeps murdering somebody, murdering somebody every single week? Well, we'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? But that wasn't Jerry Cook's point, nor is it mine. Although it does make you think, this was rather gutsy of Jesus to answer Peter the way he did. You remember that day? I don't know what they were doing, but Peter suddenly pipes up in the middle of the day. He says, I've been thinking, God. And when Peter thinks, look out. I've been thinking, God. How many times should I forgive my brother who sins against me? Seven? See, Peter, the rabbis in his day, from a mistaken interpretation of a single line in Amos, thought that three would be the limit. So Peter says, I'm going to double it, so throw in one to make it a perfect number. Seven times I forgive a brother who sins against me. And then Jesus replies to Peter on the screen, please. Familiar words. You know these words. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven can you believe that? 490 times. I'm supposed to forgive a sister who sins against me, a brother who sins against me, 490 times. Please. Clearly, would you write this down? Clearly, God does not intend to attach a statute of limitations to how often we are to love, how often we are to accept, and to forgive fellow sinners. Keep your pen moving. Remember, love, acceptance, and forgiveness are not about granting license to sinners, but rather about showing love to sinners like you and me. Showing love. The first play in your hand is love. You play the heart. Just like Jesus. And when Ken and Floyd love Rosaria like Jesus did, like God does, she could feel the love. And guess what? That's how she came to believe the love. She had to first feel it, and then she came to believe it. Ken and Floyd loved her. God won her, because that's how it works. We do the loving. Calvary does the winning. The winning's his business. The loving is ours. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus looked at her and loved her. My. The question I suppose it begs to be asked is, come on, Dwight, I mean, how, how, how? How does this kind of love grow up in me? How does it grow up in us? How do we become a church that loves all sinners who enter its doors? Fair question. Actually, the answer is quite uncomplicated, embarrassingly simple, to be honest with you. In fact, if we, if we put two lines together, and this didn't hit me. This is the first time in my life that, that, that hit me this last week as I'm preparing for today. If you put two lines together, you got the how. Watch this. I mean, two lines that every Christian on this planet already knows. Two lines. You put them together. There's your how. The first line everybody knows. We talked about it. We sang a little hymn about it a moment ago. Uh, number one, jot it down, please, the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? So everybody knows the fruit of the Spirit passage. But just, be, just in case we all need a little brusher upper, let's go to Galatians chapter 5 and uh, drop down to verse... Uh, Galatians 5, drop down to verse 22 and 23. These are the fruits of the Spirit. Everybody knows this. Okay, so Galatians 5, put it on the screen for you as well. Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nine graces of the Christian life, nine, nine fruits, as it were, nine of them. Wow. But did you notice what we just read? Did you see how it reads? It reads in the singular, the fruit of the Spirit 
It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It says the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. And scholars and commentators have kind of wrestled over this one. Nobody's quite sure. Why did Paul write it in the singular? One suggestion is, I, I give this to you as a possibility. One suggestion is that the, it, it, Paul put it in the singular to remind us that there is a single source for these fruits. Oh, boy, that's true, isn't it? I mean, you think about it. On the eat, he's going to be dead in less than 24 hours. He's dead and buried in, in less than 24 hours. And what does Jesus say to them? Put it on the screen, please. Jesus says to his followers, I am the vine, you are the what? Yeah, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much. What's the word? You'll bear much fruit. Jot that down in your study guide. You're going to bear fruit. You stay in me and I stay in you. You're going you're to have fruit. Oh, and by the way, apart from me, you can do zero, nada, nothing. Zilch. In other words, the fruit, the fruit only comes through me. The only way you can have fruit is through me. Without me, no fruit. He's the vine, we are the branches. He's the source, we are the recipients. It's all about Jesus. You say, Dwight, are you serious? Of course I'm serious. In fact, let's do, let's do the little Jesus test right here, okay? So we're going to do a Jesus test on Galatians 5 on the, on the fruits of the Spirit here. Uh, in verse, well, here's what we're going to do. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, but we're going to say, but the portrait of Jesus is, okay? So we're going to turn it into a portrait. Let's see if it fits. But the portrait of Jesus is love. Would that fit for you? Hmm? But the portrait of Jesus is joy. Still, okay? But the portrait of Jesus is peace. His picture is patience. His picture is kindness. The portrait of Jesus is goodness. It's faithfulness. The, portrait, the picture of Jesus is gentleness and self-control. Does it, does it pass the Jesus test? It sure does. All of that is the way he lived in our midst. Whoa. Maybe they're right. Maybe that's why Paul chose the fruit to be singular, so that it all comes from one source, and the source is our Lord Jesus. Oh, but somebody else says, wait a minute, wait a minute. It could be the other. Time out. Let me, let me offer an alternative suggestion, and this is perhaps viable. Here's the alternative. Because the first fruit is the crowning fruit that defines all others that follow, Paul says the fruit of the Spirit. Let's put it on the screen. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's, what he's, that's his point. It's love. Everything else, is, everything else flows out of love. Well, I suppose that could work too. Joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness, all flows out of love. Hey, I buy that. But then, right, this was, it was right here in my study this last week. That suddenly... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This line, this line, this line. Hey, that other line. I want to check that other line. Could it be that they are, they are bound together? Let's check the other line. So the first line is the fruit of the Spirit. Jot this down. Line number two is the fruit of love, the fruit of love. And because uh, love is on everybody's mind this season of the year, let's go to the love chapter of the Bible. That would be 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. This is the great love chapter. Everybody knows this. Oh, this is a, this is a moving, moving a chapter. Read it this morning. Just read it to myself. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm like a boom, clanging cymbal. So he goes through that. But I want to drop down to where he, he really laser focuses in on the definition of love. Drop down to verse 4. Let's read. Let's just look at these three verses here. Verse 4, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Verse 5, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Keep reading. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Now, verse 7, it always protects. Love always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. And then I just love that next line, love never fails. By the way, we need to ask the question, does this passage, like the fruit passage, does it, does it stand up to the Jesus test? So let's find out. Let's go back now. And everywhere it says love, we'll switch it with the name, with the, with the name of Jesus. Verse 4, love is patient. Okay, so that reads, Jesus is patient. Are we, is, is, is that work so far? Jesus is kind. It does not envy. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not boast. Jesus is not proud, verse 5. Jesus does not dishonor others. Jesus is not self-seeking. He's not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus do does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Jesus always protects. He always trusts. He always hopes. He always perseveres. Jesus never fails. But does that work? Let's try it one more time. Let's put your name in it.
right? It's embarrassing, isn't it? Dwight, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. It meets the Jesus test. And that's why, that's why it's such a big deal, because the Jesus test is for his own people to begin to reflect the Jesus picture, the Jesus fruit. Wow. So I said, okay, come on, Dwight, put them, put them side by side. And can you believe this? They're, they're almost identical. Put it on the screen, side by side. Look at this. You have Galatians 5 on the left. You have 1 Corinthians 13. They both begin with love, love. Well, we got that part that matches so far. The next one is joy. The other one's rejoices. Well, that works too. The next one is peace and not ease the anger. Well, that would sure be peace that passes understanding because you're not ticked off. The next, one's, the next one is long-suffering. Galatians 5 suffers long. 1 Corinthians 13. I think that works. What's the next one? Kindness. Galatians 5 and kind. 1 Corinthians 13. Keep going. Goodness, Galatians 5, does not delight in evil. Well, that would be a good way to live. Just you don't celebrate somebody falling into sin or just messing up and morally melting down. You don't rejoice in that. The next one, faithfulness, in 1 Corinthians, always trust. Galatians speaks about gentleness, keeps no record of wrongs. And finally, self-control. And in 1 Corinthians 13, what does it read? Is not self-seeking. Here's the point, ladies and gentlemen. Look at The two lists can be woven together into a single tapestry because both lists are a description of Jesus. That's the deal. It's all a picture of Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. And Jesus looked at her and loved him. And Jesus looked down from the cross. And he loved them all. <laughs> so how can I be like Jesus? How can I get this love of Jesus in my heart so that my heart kind of begins to feel the love like his did? Ah, well, it's the fruit of the Spirit. And it's, Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. I mean, this is really not rocket science now, is it? That's precisely how you come to love, accept, and forgive just like Jesus. Every day you abide in him. Every day he abides in you through the Holy Spirit. How will he daily abide in you? Come on. It's through the Holy Spirit. How did Jesus, how did Jesus get the Holy Spirit in him every day? How did he get it? How did he get the Holy Spirit in him every single day? Let me put these words. We looked at these last fall. Let me throw them up again. Morning by morning, Jesus communicated with his Father in heaven, receiving from him daily a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's it. You want the fruit of Jesus? You need the Spirit of Jesus. You want the Spirit of Jesus? Ask him. Ask to be baptized every single day. It's yours. Yours. Free of charge, every morning, a fresh baptism. Boy, I want to love like Jesus. I really do. I mess up, very embarrassed. I have to write emails of apology. Bad. But he's not giving up on me. He doesn't give up on us. Stay with me, boy. Stay with me. You abide in me. Let me abide in you. You know that fruit? I'll give you the real stuff, that fake stuff, the veneer that you pretend like you're all of this and everybody knows the people that know you best. You're not all of that. That fake fruit, I take it away. I give you the real fruit. <sighs> now, one of the two prayers, Holy Spirit, today, pour God's love into me. And then before you leave your little place or wherever it is you have your worship every morning, before you leave, don't forget the second prayer. Holy Spirit, I'm leaving now. Pour, your, pour the love of God out of me. Pour the love of God in me to begin the day in, the, in this little prayer time. And now spend the rest of the day pouring the love of God out of me. The daily baptism of the Holy Spirit is immersion in the love of God. And Jesus looked at her and he loved her. They never met in their lives, but he loved her. Wow. You know what? If you want to kind of freshen up that daily uh, two prayer business, because that can get pretty monotonous, here's what you could do. You could read 1 Corinthians 13 every day of your life for the rest of your life. And I, I suggest that you could read a lot worse every day than to take a look at this word picture of the very character of Jesus. Every day you read it. What is it? How many verses? 15? 16? Every day. I wish I could tell you that that's an original thought with me. <laughs> it's not. Let me put Ellen White's words on the screen. Take a look at this. The Lord desires me to call the attention of his people to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Uh-oh. That's just what we were talking about. Read this chapter every day. Wait a minute. 
Read this chapter every day and from it obtain comfort and strength. Learn that Christ-like love is of heavenly birth and that without it, all other qualifications are worthless. Just read it every day. Every day. I got a little pamphlet. It's long out of print. 31 different translations of, of, of 1 Corinthians 13. Every day a new translation. You could you put one of those together yourself. Just go online. Just get all 13. Line them up. Print them off. Let me know when they're all ready to go and we'll, we'll just give, give the PDF to everyone who wants it. Read a different translation every day. Read the same one every day. Memorize it. Concentrate on verses 4 to 7 because that describes how Jesus wants to love through you today. Is that hard? It's not. Hey, listen, listen, listen. This daily baptism in the Holy Spirit, come on, Dwight. Get off it. I'm not getting off it. You know why? Because, listen, listen. We will never, and I have it italicized in mind, we will never become a loving people and a loving church until the fruit of the Spirit and the love of Jesus can be seen and felt in us. Can you feel the love when you're around them? Yeah, I can. Can you feel the love when you're around her? Yes, I can. Can you feel the love when you're around him? Yes, I can. It's only when you feel the love that you know something's there. Can't feel it? It's not there. Fake fruit. Genuine fruit. And he looked on him. He looked on her. Oh, God. Won't you please make us that people on this campus and in this little community so that of us it will be said, and, they, and, and we saw him and we saw her and we love them, every single one of them that walked through these doors, just like Jesus. Amen. I'd like to take one more moment with you here at the end of our program to offer you something I think is really special. I want to send to you this little book called Story of Hope. In this sweeping look at the story of the Bible, you're going to journey from the dawn of the human race in the Garden of Eden through the stunning narratives of the ancient patriarchs and prophets and kings straight to the breathtaking story of our Lord Jesus. And then beyond the New Testament, the prophetic story of how life on this planet ends and then begins again. With my team of leaders, we are reading through this book every Monday afternoon, and I promise you, you're going to get blessed. I want to make sure you get this book. No charge to you. So grab your phone and dial our toll-free number, 877, and then the two words, His Will. That's 877-H-I-S-W-I-L-L. Just give one of our friendly operators your name and mailing address, and the book will be in the mail. So be blessed. And until the next time we meet, may the peace of our Lord Jesus go with you.